Why don't we go ahead and start? Um, you ready, yeah. Justin? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So welcome everybody. This is the third in our series of webinars this year. We're trying to do the whole virtual thing again for 2021. Uh, but welcome to all of you. Um, happy to be able to have this opportunity to offer this class. It seems like there's been a lot of interest in hearing loss and coping with hearing loss. So I'm really excited about this presentation today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Susan Fados. I'm the executive director of the XLH Network. Um, and this is Justin Slack. Justin is a hearing aid professional uh, with over 15 years in the business and he operates the listening stack. I said Justin Slack, right? Did I? It's Justin Stack and he operates the <laughs> listening stack. Close enough. <laughs> in Capitola, California. Um, so I will, without further ado, turn this over to Justin. And again, for those of you that are just joining us, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat window. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here and allowing me to uh, elaborate on hearing loss in general and uh, regarding uh, your guys' community. So I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to do this for everyone. Um, like Susan was saying, you'll see my eyes bounce around from low to high. That's because I have two monitors set up, so I apologize if that's distracting. Um, but basically, <clears throat> I wanted to start uh, with some general info and go over a uh, few things in general um, that pertain to hearing loss, uh, the different types of hearing loss, and then we'll move forward with uh, some resources and a few other things. Um, but feel free to ask the questions and we'll address them uh, as we move along. Um, okay, so I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. Uh, Susan, would you see if you could enable share, uh, screen sharing? <clears throat> Sorry about While that. you're doing that, oh, it's okay. While you're doing that, basically, uh, there are a few different types of. Oh, sorry. I forget this every time. Yeah, you should be. And if you can't, if you can't do it, don't worry about it. I'll uh, I'll do the best I can with just an explanation. That's fine. I think you're good to go down. Okay, let's see. There we go. Perfect. Okay, can you guys see the audiogram? Or Susan, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So this is just a typical uh, high frequency hearing loss. Um, you can see the right ear in red and the uh, left ear in blue. <clears throat> this is a fairly typical hearing loss. Um, and let me ask one other question, Susan. Uh, can you see my cursor right here moving around mild? Does that show up? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so a few different types of hearing loss, basically. You have a couple different distinguishing factors. Uh, you have severity, which is on this right axis vertically. Um, that has to do with the level of hearing loss that you're dealing with. And then you have uh, the type of hearing loss or the frequencies that might have uh, deficiency or issues, which is a top, across the horizontal axis at the top here. On the left side of the audiogram, on this side over here, you have uh, lower frequencies, which typically control the overall volume of hearing loss. And over here, you have higher frequencies, which control the clarity of speech and hearing loss. So essentially, uh, when people are talking about hearing loss, when they, when they say they can't hear, or they can hear, but they can't understand, they're usually talking about a hearing loss that looks similar to this, which is normal or mild hearing loss in the low frequencies, and then a dipping hearing loss. And obviously this is kind of severe, you know, this is a very quick dip and that's not very common, but it, it does happen obviously. Um, Typically, you're talking about some deficiency in the higher frequencies, which essentially eliminate the clarity in speech. Uh, this is the biggest issue by far uh, with hearing loss individuals. Um, essentially, uh, when you're looking at an audiogram, if you're looking at your own hearing loss, obviously you're going to have a doctor or a hearing aid specialist or audiologist talking about your specific loss. Um, but if you're looking at a hearing loss like this or an audiogram, 
that's just a quick reference on how to look at this. You have uh, normal hearing from zero to 25. You have mild hearing loss from 25 to 40 decibels, so on and so forth as you go from moderate, se uh, moderate severe, severe, and profound. Um, now, some people do dip into the profound area like this person right here, uh, but that does not mean they have profound hearing loss. That just means they have profound hearing loss in this one specific frequency of 8,000 hertz, which is a high frequency. Okay, so when you're looking at this audiogram, you want to distinguish, uh, obviously, whether you have low or high frequency hearing loss or whether you have hearing loss across the board um, or something that is uh, kind of more flat. Um, but uh, as you look at this type of hearing loss, you, are, uh, you can look at these letters here uh, across the board. And these letters represent where the letter falls. So N is at about 300 hertz, roughly. O is about 600 hertz. That's the frequency the letter makes when you speak it. Um, the location on the severity level is how easy or difficult that letter is to hear. So in other words, a very easy way of looking at this is if your curve, like this curve, is above all the lower frequencies, I'm sorry, all these letters in this box, what that means is that this individual can hear these letters at a normal level of speech. So when people are talking to this person, they're not gonna have really any difficulty hearing this uh, segment of letters. Uh, now I will say, keep in mind, this is just a handful of letters. Of course, uh, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of combinations uh, of letters and uh, throughout the phonetics of speech and so forth. So this doesn't represent everything, of course, it's just a small uh, window. Now, if your hearing loss dips below certain letters, like this one does with uh, these hearing, or with these letters, uh, what that means is you do not hear these specific letters or combinations of letters at a normal level. So if people are having kind of an average normal conversation, uh, within about five feet of each other uh, in distance with a mild to moderate amount of noise in the background, this individual is not going to pick up these specific letters really at all, uh, unless the person they're talking to raises the volume of their voice significantly, mainly getting these points, these lower points down here, to a level of volume that surpasses the minimum level that this uh, letter requires. So for SH, for example, they would need to be speaking at about 25, I'm sorry, um, they would need to raise their voice about 40 decibels, which is significant. That's essentially yelling, to give you some reference. So that's kind of how hearing, that, that's a real quick snapshot of how hearing loss works. You have high and low frequencies, and everywhere in between. So obviously there are, you know, from 250 to 8,000 hertz, there are 7,750 individual frequencies, uh, which makes this a very broad snapshot, of course. But essentially all hearing loss operates like this to some degree. You have some sections you hear and you have other sections you do not hear. And the difficulty that adds for anyone with hearing loss is that, you know, certain voices, certain people, you're not really going to have a huge dilemma with, uh, while other people, you can really not hear at all, or at least not understand them clearly in average conversation. Uh, and this is the problem a lot of times with family members and spouses, you know, you have a man or a woman in the relationship or kids or, uh, uh, you know, parents or something like that, elderly parents, if, if they live with you or something. And, uh, you know, some of the time you can hear them just fine, and then others you can't. And it's really frustrating exercise for everyone involved, uh, the hearing loss individual, as well as uh, the uh, person that's in, in the friendship relationship or whatnot. So this is a good snapshot, I think, of how hearing loss works. This is what you can expect to see if you get your hearing testing. This is a standardized form. Uh, I have it mocked up to uh, make it a little easier to 
describe uh, these issues, but essentially this is what you'd be looking at when you get a hearing loss and you'll have uh, you know, a different curve based on whatever each frequency measures at. Uh, this type of hearing loss uh, or hearing test, I should say, just the basic version, which is what this is showing, uh, should only take about 15, 20 minutes to get. Um, however, if you go into a lengthier uh, hearing test, they can take up to about 45 minutes, um, depending on if you go to an audiology clinic uh, where you get clinical testing, which has to do a little more with the health of your eardrum and a few other things that standard hearing aid centers won't do uh, simply for the purpose of fitting hearing aids. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? Let me see if I can, I'll stop sharing here and take a look at the chat. Does anyone have any questions about the audiogram or need any more elaboration on what I just talked about? I'm not seeing any questions about this specific topic. Um, the one question okay. that did come up, though, is do you happen to know at what age hearing loss tar starts in people with XLH? And the second part of that is will Crispita, which is a medication for XLH, delay or reduce hearing loss? So I do not know if, uh, if that me medication for uh, XLH will have any effects. Uh, that's not really my specialty. I couldn't tell you one way or another. Um, so I need to do more research on that specifically. Um, for hearing loss regarding uh, XLH, I'm not sure uh, when that would actually start in average. I did see that roughly, uh, I think it was 8% to about 30% of people with XLH experience hearing loss. I would imagine that it's um, all over the board in terms of, uh, you know, people with uh, different types of immune systems, different types of bodies and so forth. Genetics do definitely play a role in hearing loss in general. And I would imagine that also plays an effect with or has an effect in XLH as well. Um, so what that means to clearly state is it could probably happen early in life, middle of life and towards end of life uh, as you get into your 60s and 70s. But I couldn't confirm that, but I, I, I think based on the research I did, that's probably a safe bet. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Anything else on that? Not yet. Again, feel free if you're just joining us to type your questions in the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Okay, um, so that's the type of, it, I mean, there are, virtually infinite variations of hearing loss. Uh, that, um, that audiogram that I showed you, that, that's obviously just one. That's a pretty common one that we see. The severity levels are maybe a little more severe on that particular hearing loss, but that's very common. Um, your own individual hearing loss will be yours, uh, you know, in, in the sense that it'll be unique to you. Uh, even if it's duplicated across the board, if, you know, a thousand people have your exact measurements, each one of those individuals is going to react to the hearing loss differently uh, and also going to react to hearing aids or some sort of uh, amplification differently. Um, what I mean by that is if you have a thousand individuals with exactly the same audiogram, uh, you can have a thousand different types of hearing aid fittings um, because the fitting has to do with the individual's hearing loss as well as their lifestyle and their preferences. Um, so there's no simple one solution fits all, uh, which is part of the reason why hearing aids can get really expensive. Um, you know, when I'm fitting hearing aids for individuals, we have to look at what this hearing loss is going to pose as an issue as well as the types of the, uh, the lifestyle needs of the client. So whether they work part-time or full-time or are retired, uh, whether they're social or not very social, um, if they live in by themselves or in a crowded house, um, things like that. Um, and so your experience obviously will be unique, unique to you, uh, of course, uh, but I think that's a good base or a good uh, uh, foundation of information for how hearing loss works. In terms of uh, the types of hearing aids, and actually I'm going to go back to my email really quick because I think there are a couple 
questions, this might be a good time. So bear with me for just a second here. I think, uh, Susan, you had a couple questions that you, let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, okay, I'll just have this up because this is not relevant yet. Okay, so types of hearing aids. Uh, you do have behind the ear hearing aids. Uh, you have in the ear hearing aids. Um, I'm gonna log in and share my screen again uh, with, with you guys. Okay, so this is probably a good Okay, so types of hearing aids. Um, the, the, first of all, this is Starkey. This is one of the bigger brands. This is one of the brands that I stick to, Starkey, Phonak, Unitron. Um, there, there are about six big brands out there. They're all good. Uh, if you're going with a brand name, uh, you really can't fail. Uh, the, the tool, which is the hearing aid, uh, they're all very good quality. They all have a lot of features and a lot of functions. However, you know, your individual needs will dictate which type of hearing aid might work better for you specifically. So for example, uh, this brand uh, offers direct connectivity to your cell phone. Uh, so you can connect the hearing aids to your iPhone or Samsung in order to take and make phone calls from your phone. Um, they offer rechargeable hearing aids, uh, basically the, the whole gamut. They, they go from entry level to top of line and really high end technology. And actually, this particular print plant, um, uh, brand sorry, um, has fall detection and some other really high-end features that are only offered with this company. So this is one example. This one right in the middle, this is called Receiver in Canal or RIC. That's why you see these RIC uh, abbreviations all over the place. This is the most common type of hearing aid that we fit nowadays. Uh, the biggest reasons why is it's the most robust. Uh, it can handle mild hearing loss all the way to profound hearing loss. Uh, you can get it with, you can kind of see this soft silicone tip, which is very comfortable, but you can also get it with a custom mold. Um, and custom molds are, let me see if we have any. No. Custom molds are essentially set up for different types of hearing loss um, or severity levels. So general of thumb is the more severe your hearing loss, uh, the more likely you are to ha have or need a custom mold. But this technology is so good nowadays that uh, when you get fit with it, often they, the fitting specialist or the audiologist will opt for um, fitting you with a universal solution first because it's the most comfortable and the quickest and the easiest to adapt to. Uh, but often uh, if your hearing loss is not, uh, or if it's too severe, you will uh, need to get a custom mold. So this is one style. Uh, another style might be a standard behind the ear, and this uses a larger ear hook, as you can see here, in combination with a custom ear mold. And there is no custom ear mold in this picture here, but essentially it wraps to a tube and then uh, places the uh, either soft silicone or hard acrylic ear mold into the ear. Um, let's see here. Okay. So we have the Rick style. We have the custom BTE or the BTE with a custom mold. And then we have these two right here. These are called, uh, custom molded in the canal or in the ear hearing aids. And this style is essentially where you have all the functions, all the features, all the electronics stuffed into a custom molded shell for your ear. Now this particular one is rechargeable, which is why you see these little metal contacts. They do actually make smaller hearing aids than this. Um, I think that's under, there we go. These are, this is kind of the full gamut of custom. You have IIC, which are invisible in canal. You have CIC, which are completely in canal. You have 
ITC in the in the canal, which is a little bigger, and in the ear, which is ITE. These are essentially the four styles. Each manufacturer has probably a couple more added in there, but in general, this is kind of what you're looking at with custom made hearing aids. Um, the reason you might wear one of these versus, you know, behind the ear hearing aid like this, uh, today or nowadays, uh, it could be because of the masks uh, for COVID. Um, it could just be that you wear oxygen or glasses. Uh, if you don't have any other um, accessories on your ears, like a mask or glasses, uh, you know, this behind the ear style, you know, is not going to have any real negative interaction with anything. It's not going to fall off or anything like that. So this is a really good style. But in the ear hearing aids uh, have a uh, purpose as well, uh, just not as big nowadays as it used to be. So anyway, those are the three different styles of hearing aids. Uh, any questions so far? And I'll... Uh, just if I have uh, a question, actually. Yeah. Um, could you talk just a little bit about which of these types of hearing aids are better for severe hearing loss versus mild hearing loss? That's a great question. Okay. So in regards to uh, mild, severe types of hearing aids, uh, so forth, Typically, the more severe your hearing loss um, with, I'll talk about the custom molded ones. So if you have a moderate severe to severe hearing loss, which is the third or fourth stage uh, out of five stages, um, a IIC is usually not an option. You really get into the CIC and larger. Okay, and that has to do with the distance. Let's see if I can pull this. The distance from this microphone right here to the, to the tip of the canal. So if your hearing loss is very severe, if that distance is too short, you'll run into problems like a lot of feedback, which is whistling, or you know, if you've ever gone to a concert or a speaking engagement and someone gets too close to the speaker, with their microphone, you hear that awful screeching sound. That's called feedback. That happens in hearing aids occasionally. Uh, but typically, if you have a very severe hearing loss, you might need a little more distance, which means that these really small options sometimes are not an option, and you have to go to bigger ones, or you just go uh, back to a behind-the-ear style. And that's because the speaker is right here in the ear and the microphone's all the way out here on the back of the hearing aid. So for more severe hearing losses, behind the ear hearing aids are typically the best. Um, these are semi-invisible because they do use thin wires. So if you're worried about vanity or if you're worried about people noticing your hearing aids and you don't want them to, this style right here is actually very good at hiding uh, the wire and the unit behind your ear with a little bit of hair, um, you know, to conceal it, uh, not <laughs> a little bit of your hair. <laughs> they don't make the artificial hair with the hearing aids to conceal it. Um, and so anyway, uh, when you're dealing with mild to moderate hearing loss, uh, something that's higher on the scale that's not as bad, uh, really you can get any hearing aid that you want. You can go to the really small ones, um, like the IIC, those work really well, or you can actually still stick with a RIC or a behind the ear product. Um, this is actually the reason why this product is so uh, relevant and prevalent in hearing loss communities um, is because it fits anywhere from the mild hearing loss all the way to the profound hearing loss. Uh, so you can really fit almost any type of hearing loss with this style which makes it a great tool for hearing aid specialists and audiologists. Uh, did that answer your question, Susan? I think so, yeah, it did, thank you. Um, okay. We have another one here, it's a really good question. Um, and the writer says, I've been dealing with symptoms of veneers, which could cause great fluctuations in my hearing. What consideration should be made when selecting a hearing aid? Great question. So Meniere's um, disease, <clears throat> they don't know a ton about, they don't have a lot of uh, solutions for it, uh, but basically what it does is it affects your lower frequencies quite a bit more than your higher frequencies. 
Um, it can fluctuate on an hourly basis all the way to an annual basis, meaning that your hearing loss can increase or decrease throughout the day, which is definitely on the more rare side, or it can fluctuate throughout the year, uh, which is more common. And what, that, what I mean by that is if I test a client with Meniere's disease today and I retest them in one year, it can be the same, it can be better, or it can be worse. And those fluctuations can be up to 20 or 30% increase or decrease, which is significant. So with consideration of Meniere's disease, the best thing you can do, um, there are really two big factors to this. Uh, the best thing that you can do is talk to a hearing aid specialist or an audiologist. Um, if you've been formally diagnosed with Meniere's disease, which it sounds like you have, and that this is something that's been known um, in your life for a little bit, um, what you wanna do is get frequent hearing tests for about a year. And frequent might mean once every six weeks uh, to two months. So maybe six to eight hearing tests in one year. And what that does is it allows you and your uh, specialist to look at the types of fluctuations that will happen throughout a, you know, an average year um, and determine which type of hearing aid uh, will work the best for the highest and the lowest versions of those hearing loss. In addition to that, so once you determine that with your specialist, um, you will be able to potentially get a hearing aid that not only can be adjusted you know, relatively easy if you're having a down moment or an up moment with your Meniere's, but it will allow you to make on the, on the fly adjustments. Um, so for example, this hearing aid right here, the Livio, this is a direct connect hearing aid. And what that means is it can connect directly to your iPhone or your uh, Samsung uh, with an app and give you some control over volume and some frequency settings. So if you're having a down day with the Meniere's, you can increase the volume in the area that is low uh, to compensate temporarily. If you're having an up day, you can decrease the volume in the area that is high or vice versa. But it'll give you some control on a daily basis or on a on the fly basis to really help you address the issue. Uh, Meniere's is a tricky one too. You definitely wanna spend the time with your hearing specialist uh, to create a plan uh, of how to really help your Meniere's specifically. Um, the second thing with Meniere's, uh, and keep in mind, I did not say this at the beginning. I said I was going to to Susan and I forgot. I'm not a doctor um, and nothing I'm saying here today can be taken as medical advice. I just wanna let everyone know that um, all this stuff is general information and some of it might pertain to you, some of it might not. So obviously take it all in. Um, and then if you're having these issues, whether it's Meniere's or just a standard hearing loss, go to a licensed professional in your area and get the rest of the details that are specific to you. And I think a lot of what I just said is common sense nowadays. I mean, this is uh, run of the mill stuff when you're um, trying to figure out more answers about any health issue at all. Uh, but just a heads up there. Um, okay, the second thing with Meniere's is Meniere's can be affected by diet, uh, blood pressure, overall health. So there are definitely, uh, if you have Meniere's, you should also be talking to a nutritionalist um, and other types of specialists to help mitigate it because I have had clients on the very extreme side of things to where their Meniere's does fluctuate on a daily basis, which is, um, I've only had a couple of those clients in the last 15 years, but what they noticed with themselves is that if they ate certain types of proteins, such as red meats uh, or even white meats, their Meniere's would act differently than if they had a vegetarian diet for that day. 
Um, and again, that's on the very extreme size, uh, side of things. Most people with Meniere's do not have those types of fluctuations uh, uh, based on diet uh, on a daily basis. However, uh, there have been a few studies that show vegan diets and um, high plant protein and plant-based diets, so vegetarian basically, do have some sort of effect on Meniere's disease. Uh, whether it's minuscule or dramatic, that's up to the individual, of course. So it is worth uh, talking to a nutritionist as well to find out a meal plan and a uh, essentially a nutrition plan that works for you and your body. Great question. There's a question here. Does salt affect mirrors? Um, I, I don't know uh, if salt directly does, but I know sodium in general does affect certain parts of your health. And I would, I don't think it's a far stretch that too much salt or sodium in your diet could potentially have a negative effect on your Meniere's. But I do not know that for certain, so it's worth doing uh, some research on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, now, this is a good time, I will say. One, I, I'm going to email Susan a link or a um, list of links of the information we're talking about today so everyone can uh, review uh, independent research and review things on their own. But there is one um, institute called, called House Institute. Uh, it's located in Los Angeles, um, and it's a nonprofit, non-biased um, or unbiased foundation that researches audiology in general. So it could be as simple as standard hearing loss uh, with individuals, and it can also get into Meniere's disease and very rare conditions uh, in the ear as well. So they kind of handle and research everything about ears and audiology and ear health. Uh, they're a really good resource. They have a newsletter that you could subscribe to, I believe. And they're just a really great place to go if you're trying to research um, certain aspects of hearing loss or audiology in general. And again, I'll, I'll uh, email that link uh, out so you guys can have reference to it. Okay, what else? Oh, and I got House Air Institute up here. Howard P. House. Um, kind of an amazing guy, actually. He, he, he's been, he, you know, I, I believe he passed away, but uh, he'd been doing this um, and kind of started this whole movement, uh, I believe, himself. So, <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, okay, any other questions uh, regarding that? There's not any right now. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see, what else do we want to go into here? Bring this page back up. Okay, so we have, we've gone over the hearing loss, a few different types, uh, a few different hearing aids, um, brands of hearing aids, and what you can expect if you're actually making a decision on purchasing hearing aids. Um, first of all, every brand has their pros and cons. Um, you know, Starkey has a lot of pros and a few cons. Phonak, Unitron, they all develop their own products and technology. So naturally, uh, they're going to have a few really great things and then a few things that don't make sense. Uh, and examples of that are maybe the type of recharge or the type of charging platform they use for the rechargeable might be inefficient or annoying to click in and out of the charger. So typically they're not fundamental pros and cons, they're uh, little things here and there. So when you go to a hearing aid specialist or an audiologist, they're, they're, that office is typically going to have one or two brands that they prefer to fit or sell. Um, whichever couple of brands they're fitting or selling are going to be okay. They're going to be one of the big six brands. And again, I'll list these brands out um, so you guys can uh, have reference to them and their websites. But the brand is not really so much the issue. Uh, when you're getting fit with hearing aids, uh, whether you're getting entry-level devices that are less expensive or mid-level devices or high-end or top-line devices, 
the device itself is a tool. So it's similar to a hammer. You know, you, you, a hammer doesn't build a house. Um, it can hammer nails and hit things. The person wielding the hammer, the carpenter, that's the person's skill set. That's the person that's actually going to make or accomplish the task at hand with the hammer, with the tool. And in, the, in this analogy, I'm considered the, the carpenter and the hammer is the hearing aid. Um, the hearing aid is an unbiased tool. It just, it's just a thing. Um, you can make them do a lot of different things. You can manipulate them in a lot of different ways to help uh, the client's needs. But the bottom line is all of the tools are roughly similar. Like I said, they all have pros and cons, and definitely there are some that will work for a certain individual better than another, but it's really difficult to know ahead of time which tool is best for you. So the things that you wanna look out for are not only the pricing structure uh, that the office has and whether it's competitive or not, but you also wanna really look at the individual fitting your hearing aids. Um, that's the fitting specialist, the hearing aid specialist, the audiologist. It is critical, I cannot um, overstate this, that that person knows what they're doing and that you're comfortable with them. Now, you're not going to know if they know what they're doing ahead of time. It's, you know, there are a lot of people that talk really well and are real slick with words and, and then you kind of get into the process and you can tell they don't know what they're doing. <clears throat> I hate to make this sound like uh, a go with your gut type of thing, but it, it at least has to start there. Um, in California and most states in the U.S., hearing aids have a mandatory refund period. Now, in some states like California, and, and you could probably say more liberal states or more social um, uh, focused uh, or uh, states that have better social programs, I guess, uh, for health, are going to require full refunds uh, within a 45-day period. Meaning if you buy a set of hearing aids, costs a lot of money, and then you find out the hearing aid specialist or the office is not exactly what they, they were cracked up to be in terms of service or care or skill level, you do have a full 45 days in California to return those hearing aids, get 100% of your money back. They cannot retain $1. Um, and you definitely, and a lot of offices will extend that. So for example, my office, we do a 60 day full refund trial period, uh, with option to exchange and extend and a whole bunch of different things. So an uh, office like mine is very, um, easy to get that type of stuff done because we're very patient focused, uh, and aftercare focused. However, some of the offices are more sales focused, um, and, Again, you'll typically know those offices, you'll go into them, it'll feel like a sales pitch, it will feel like they're trying to get you to buy something they want to sell you. It's not to say that's always a bad thing. Uh, I'm not bashing those offices as not knowing what they're doing. Uh, they often do. Uh, but you also want to go with your gut and figure out if that type of office is the best type of office for you. And if you feel like they have the skill set to back up what they're trying to sell you. And again, sometimes that's impossible to determine ahead of the time. I, I get that. Uh, but, you know, again, do the best you can if you're trying to determine that type of uh, big decision for yourself. And always ask them and talk to them about the return and the refund period. Because in some states, they do require returns uh, within a 30 or 40 day period but they do not require full refunds. Sometimes, for example, in certain states, they, the specialist can retain up to like 25%, which could be $1,000 know, uh, in some cases. So you really wanna, before you commit to anything, you, you really wanna take the time to talk to them uh, about some of these things uh, very bluntly, in my opinion, if you're comfortable with that. <clears throat> so, uh, let's see, I lost my train of thought here. Um, we were talking about um, the experience of purchasing. Actually, can I follow up on what you were just saying? One of the questions yeah. that has come up 
is um, are there any options for lower cost hearing aids or um, any way to supplement the high cost of them that you know about? Yeah, great question. So um, the hearing aid, uh, the typical cost of a set of hearing aids, and most people do need two hearing aids. I think it's something like 95% of the hearing loss population needs and uses two, one for left and right. Um, so the typical cost range of a set of hearing aids is anywhere as low of around $2,800, $2,800, all the way up to about $6,800 and sometimes more. Um, Costco uh, does have, uh, is actually a really good resource for low cost hearing aids. Um, you do suffer a little bit in the uh, service department not that they're unwilling to service, they definitely are. They have great refund and exchange policies. The equipment that they fit and sell is decent equipment. It's made, it's private labeled or branded with Costco sometimes like the Kirkland brand and so forth. But it is made by one of the big six manufacturers. And their hearing aids, I think their pricing goes as low as about $1,500 for a set of hearing aids at the very entry level. So if you're looking at cost paying out of pocket, I will get into the foundations and the ones that do offer financial support in a second. But if you're looking at just paying out of pocket, the least expensive options are gonna be about $1,500 to about $3,000 for a set. And that's gonna be through a company like Costco. Um, but the service and quality will definitely be different at Costco. Sometimes they're really good because the individual running that office is really good, but oftentimes they're par or subpar uh, service. It's just not super high quality. So if you need more time and attention, paying more than $3,000 for a set will probably get that for you. Now, in regards to private pay, most insurances do not offer hearing aid coverage. Um, if you're on Medi-Cal or Medicaid, um, there is full coverage for those. So if you have Medi-Cal services in California with Central California Alliance or state-run Medi-Cal, uh, you can get hearing aids at a provider that offers Medi-Cal pricing because they, they don't pay very much and so not all offices offer that. But you can get um, Medi-Cal pricing, or I'm sorry, uh, Medi-Cal or uh, federally run Medicaid to pay for the hearing aids in full. Um, depending on the, uh, the local office, sometimes they'll order okay equipment. Sometimes they order really nice equipment. Uh, it just depends. Uh, for example, my office is a Medi-Cal contracted provider, and we offer mid-level devices for a medical Medi-Cal clients. And so it is a, it is a really good hearing aid, uh, basically, that you get at no charge, at least no charge to you. In terms of uh, other private pay, uh, there are financing options available. So you can lease hearing aids uh, for very inexpensive, you know, uh, I think it starts at about $75 per month for leasing. You can finance hearing aids with no interest financing for up to 12 months, typically. Um, so you can essentially pay it off over a year, or you can finance it with about a 12% APR typically um, for up to five years. So in terms of private pay, you're looking at private insurance, Medi-Cal or Medicaid, or paying out of pocket with some sort of financing. If you're looking, Sorry. oh yeah. Real quickly, what about Medicare? Medicare does not offer any payment structure whatsoever for hearing aids. Um, which is very unfortunate. Uh, and the reason why is most, even though hearing loss is not age dependent, um, you can get hearing loss at any point in your life for really any reason. It can be genetic, it can be uh, noise induced, it can be an accident. Um, but most clients are seniors, most are 65 plus. And if Medicare pay, did pay uh, for them or even pay partially for them, the pricing structure probably could drop because the quantity would go up. Um, the reason I mention this is if you guys, uh, your community advocates um, for these types of things in general, that's definitely something worth 
advocating for, <laughs> getting Medicare to, to help pay some or all uh, of the costs would be amazing. Now, in terms of supplemental insurance to Medicare, sometimes they do. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with that, you get Medicare when you're, I think, 65 years old, you're allowed to buy supplemental insurance that essentially will pick up the bill for items that Medicare doesn't pay. Or for example, if they pay $30 of a hundred dollar prescription, the supplemental will pay the other 70 per, uh, the other $70. Now, Medicare doesn't have any billing structure for hearing aids. And so what that means is uh, the supplementals are not required to pay anything for hearing aids. Uh, so in a general structure, that's how it is. However, there, uh, there are a lot of supplemental insurances to Medicare that have additional hearing aid plans built into them that do offer anywhere from a few hundred dollars in coverage to a few thousand dollars in coverage. So if you have Medicare and a supplemental, it's worth talking to your supplemental company about that and finding out if the coverage is already there or uh, finding out if it's an option or a feature that you can add for an extra cost. Sometimes they do, um, but in general, not typically. Interesting. While we're on the topic of cost, there's a couple of other ones. Um, would the Lions Club or some organization such as that assist with the cost? Mm-hmm. That was actually uh, what I was about to say just a second ago. Um, so that's great that you brought it up. Uh, Ear the Line, uh, which is a branch of the Lions Club, is a nonprofit. They, char they will um, do income assessment. You do have to be in a certain income bracket that they will verify with tax returns and so forth. So just a heads up there. Um, they're very easy to deal with from my experience. Uh, we're a provider of uh, Earline, meaning that we offer our fitting services in my business uh, for free to Earline clients as just a way to help out the community and so forth. But they essentially do charge for the hearing aids. It's $150 per hearing aid, and they will qualify you based on one hearing aid or two hearing aids based on your hearing loss or income level. So what that means is if you get approved for ear line, uh, you're going to pay $150 per ear and they will lease you or loan you a set of their used hearing aids. Uh, they get hearing aids donated to them from all over the country. Um, and those hearing aids go into a local hearing aid bank uh, repair center typically that will refurbish them, clean them, check them. And then if they're good to go, they, get, uh, they are accessible uh, by the specialist, me, uh, to fit on your behalf uh, at no charge above and beyond the $150 per year. The pros and cons are obvious, the, typically at the airline. The pro is that you're getting a set of hearing aids for $300. The con is that you don't know, you don't have a lot of choice of what you get. You're, you're, you're essentially getting whatever is available. And sometimes what's available is a six month old, perfectly new, perfectly good set of hearing aids uh, that might've cost four or $5,000. However, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes you get a four year old hearing aid and although it's still good technology and it'll probably still be mid-level or higher end, it might be older and used uh, a lot more than, you know, the six month old or the one year old ones. So it, it's a mixed bag, but in general, it's a, it, it is by far the best low income option or low cost option that you have available to you. Thanks, Justin. Um, on that yeah. same topic, we have another question. Um, how long does a hearing aid typically last? How often would one have to replace it? outside of a change in hearing loss that would obviously necessitate a change in the device. Yeah, so hearing aids, the national average for how hearing aid, how long hearing aids last is 5.6 years. Uh, so I typically tell people to budget for um, every five years. Um, now, if you're private pay, if you're a private pay client and you're just paying out of pocket, uh, you can budget essentially $1,000 a year 
um, every five year or for five years, which gives you $5,000 of budget at the end of that time period. Now, obviously, if, if you can't do that much um, or, you know, you can't budget anything, then you just have to take the purchase in stride and either go with an uh, option like your line or a finance option um, or just paying out of pocket if you have savings and so forth. Um, but that's pretty common. What were the second two things in that? You said the time frame. What was the other part of the question? Basically, just I think you answered it. How long does it last? How often would one have to replace it? If it wasn't just a change in the hearing loss, that would necess necessitate a different advice. Different device. Gotcha. Yeah. So the, the all hearing aids nowadays are adjustable, and what that means is we can hook them up to our computer um, and program different changes in your hearing loss at any time. And the range of hearing loss that a hearing aid will fit might be a huge range, but your hearing loss might only fall on the very small section of that. And so typically you don't need to buy a new hearing aid in order to adapt your current hearing aid to a new hearing loss. However, after about 5.6 years, people either lose one or both of their hearing aids uh, one or both of their hearing aids breaks, gets eaten by a dog, is lost, something like that. Um, those are the, that, that's about 60% of the replacements that we do at around five to six years are one's lost or broken, essentially, or both of them are. The other reason that you would replace them is the other two reasons. One is just preference. You want to replace them. You want to get newer technology because, uh, the ones you have are limited in some way. Um, and then the other reason might be you it, not, I wouldn't say rare cases, but it's a little more rare that you more or less, you know, outgrow your, your hearing aids. And what that means is your hearing loss really goes beyond the point of capability um, of, of what it can fit for your hearing loss or fix for your hearing loss. Um, this is, this is, and this ties back to the Meniere's question. Meniere's disease, the reason you want to do that testing structure I suggested, which you do, you know, one test every couple months. <laughs> she, she wanted to say something, so be part of the conversation. That's Susan's dog. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're still on mute. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. Um, uh, let's see, what was I saying? Oh, the Meniere's. Uh, the reason why you want to get tested every two months and build this plan uh, is because you don't want to buy a hearing aid. Uh, and you don't know, you, you can't buy a hearing aid and, and plan for a robust um, fitting uh, capability of that hearing aid and then get tested over the next year um, to make sure that you're well within those margins of what the hearing aid can handle for your changing hearing loss. But, you know, Meniere's disease might be one of the rare cases that uh, you're, you're more likely or a lot more likely to outgrow your hearing loss because the Meniere's changes suddenly or does something abnormal um, to your situation. So That's it right now for questions. I just okay. want to reiterate one thing that Justin said, though, is that if you have a dog, be very careful about where you put your hearing aids. I am the victim of... I think now three sets of hearing aids that have been eaten by my dog. So just wow. in there. Yeah, it's a, it's a real, it is a real problem. Let me tell you. Um, dog, so dogs will eat the hearing aids. Cats will hide them. Uh, so if you have dogs or cats, um, you definitely want to put them in a case. Uh, you know, you don't want to put them on the counter or the coffee table. You want to have kind of a dedicated spot. Most hearing aids, this is a great segue to uh, some of the brands offering loss and damage insurance. So all of them will offer some sort of uh, warranty and replacement policy. And those are two different coverages that run simultaneous to each other. So most companies are going to offer a minimum one-year warranty and one-year loss and damage insurance. However, when you talk to bigger offices or offices that have really good contracts, again, such as our, our company, 
we typically will negotiate better terms for our clients to give a broader coverage spectrum. And so, for example, almost all of our brands, we deal with all of the six different brands of hearing aids. All of them, I think, except for one, offer our company and our clients three years of warranty and three years of loss and damage insurance. So when you purchase them, it's automatically on there. Now the insurance itself is free, but there is typically a deductible anywhere from $350 to $500 uh, for a replacement. So what that means is you buy your hearing aids, uh, you lose one six months later, you pay $350 and they replace it with a new one, with the same one. Now keep in mind that that replacement policy is only one time. Uh, per ear. So if you lose the right one, they'll replace that for 350. You lose the left one, they'll replace that for 350. And now it's exhausted. Uh, however, I will say there are uh, state farm insurance offers a personal articles policy. And uh, Susan, you're not the only one that's had this problem with the dogs. Uh, I have a client whose dog has eaten over $15,000 worth of hearing aids. Uh, no joke. <laughs> And when you're dealing with that type of number, it's, I blame, I blame the client. <laughs> it's not the dog's fault. They're just a dog that, you know, they don't know. Um, it, it, if you've lost that much money in it, you got to take some response, you know. Um, but it, with, with with them, they have a personal articles policy. Um, and what that means is they pay a certain percentage to State Farm. I think it's like 6%. And then they get free replacements. Um, uh, when, when it happens or if it happens, uh, and it's not perfect, you know, it's prorated, but it's something like that, um, which is available at least. So dogs and cats definitely will eat them or play with them. Uh, and any other animal, uh, like birds or, you know, things like that. Also children, um, again, children just, you know, they don't know the cost of things and whether it's important or not. So if you have children running around the house, anything like that, uh, or if you're ever visiting family members and they have children, uh, definitely keep them in a case or somewhere safe, just, just so an accident doesn't happen. Okay, so we've gone over some financial ear of the lion. Okay, uh, medical insurance, I think I've covered. Okay. Oh, um, some accessories I think I can talk about. Is there any other questions uh, currently that I should pause for? Um, no, there's not. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, accessories. Uh, so I told you guys about uh, the Direct Connect hearing aids. Uh, those are going to connect to iPhones and Samsungs and, and a handful of other phones as well that are smartphones. Uh, to do a series of features and functions basically for free. Uh, you know, it's just an app you download for free and then it can connect to the hearing aids. There are additional accessories. Uh, one might be a TV kit. So it hooks up to your TV so it can transmit the sound directly from your TV to your hearing aids. Um, that's very useful if you live with someone and if they like the TV very low. Um, even if you have hearing aids, sometimes natural hearing individuals will want the TV lower than what the hearing loss individual can really have to hear it clearly. This is a really common problem. And so the TV kits allow you to plug essentially a small box into the back of your TV and it transmits the sound directly to your hearing aids at the proper amplified level. And um, that's a really useful function because in something like that, you can actually mute the TV if you were watching TV late at night or something like that, or you can adjust the TV to uh, the other individual's preferences and not have it affect your hearing aids whatsoever. Um, so that's a really good function and feature. Uh, another one is a remote microphone. So I have clients that either travel around the country in RVs or they go to uh, classes like their students or um, they're working full-time or part-time and they go to meetings in large conference rooms, things like that. Remote microphones um, are essentially a little microphone. This is not it, but it's essentially about this big. Uh, it's, it's a device about this big that you can either 
hand or clip on someone's lapel right up here and have them just talk naturally. And that, that voice goes to the microphone and then that microphone transmits it to your hearing aids directly. Um, those can be very helpful in certain situations. Um, they were kind of developed for the classroom environment. Uh, you know, so if you're sitting in the middle of the classroom, 30 feet away from the teacher, the, if you have hearing loss, that's a, a fail situation. I mean, you're almost guaranteed not to be able to really hear a standard classroom teacher at that scenario. So you clip the microphone or uh, on the shirt of the teacher or uh, at the podium or at the front of the room. And now you can hear them crystal clear because it's essentially like they have a mic directly to your ears. So those are a few different accessories. Those two accessories are really the most popular and, and functional. Um, okay. If there are any questions about that, let me know. But there were a few questions in an email that I'm gonna just read real quick um, to myself and then we'll see if this opens up any other things to talk about. Okay, the first question is, uh, is it worth spending the money on high price hearing aids, um, especially when they get outdated quickly? Um, that's a great question. The simple answer is sometimes, sometimes no. It depends on your hearing loss and on your lifestyle. What higher end hearing aids offer, plain and simple, is more functions and features to help you hear in a complicated environment. So complicated environment is a restaurant, a grocery store, a car, like if you're driving with a passenger, um, anything that is not one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two. You know, if you're at a small table at your house with a, a person or two, high-end hearing aids versus mid-range are not going to really make a big difference. But if you're trying to communicate with that person in the grocery store, whether it's a, a, a you know, a, a friend or a family member or the store clerk or something like that, that's when higher-end hearing aids will really do a better job. They have a lot more tools in their tool bag to help. Um, and so what you want to base your decision on is what is your lifestyle? Uh, is your lifestyle socially active? Uh, do you work part-time, full-time? Do you encounter Zoom meetings as well as in-person meetings, as well as, you know, grocery shopping and social lifestyle, things like that? The more hectic or the more busy your social lifestyle is, the better a higher end hearing aid will work and the more worth, uh, the, the better the value is at that price point. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Um, and, and actually, let me state just to be clear, mid-level hearing aids are very good as well. Um, so if you have kind of a moderate lifestyle, kind of in the middle of the road, mid-range hearing aids um, are perfectly fine typically. Uh, just depends on your lifestyle. Okay, second question. <clears throat> I'm going to interrupt you there for just a second. Um, got yeah. a couple of other questions that came up. Um, first one is, can you skip the hearing appointment and just go for the well-rounded hearing aid? Absolutely not, unfortunately. Now, I'm assuming you're talking about skip the hearing test? I'm not sure. It's much sure actually. If you can answer that in the chat, um, are you talking about skipping the hearing test? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, you cannot. So there are currently two ways of purchasing hearing aids right now. One way is the one, the way we've been talking about is you go to a hearing aid center audiology clinic, you get tested, they recommend hearing aids, they, you know, fit you with whatever you choose. That's the only effective way. The second way is over the counter hearing aids or amplifiers. And that is to answer your question, you can do that without visiting anyone. You can go online, purchase them, they usually range in cost from about $300 all the way up to a few thousand dollars per unit. So they can be very inexpensive or the same cost as a standard hearing aid. The reason why you can't do that 
is essentially what we've been talking about with uh, the tools and and uh, the carpenter. You know, if hearing loss and hearing aids are not a do-it-yourself project, um, you can't you can't effectively address certain frequencies and needs if you don't know how to address them. And going to someone that knows what they're doing, that knows how to address those needs because of experience and training and all that is well worth the money. Um, now, hearing aids are expensive. So, you know, I understand that if you can't spend $1,000 or $1,500 or more on a set of hearing aids, that's not an option at all. But if that's the case, either the line or if you're on Medi-Cal or Medicaid are the ways you want to go. And the reason why is if you spend $200 on over-the-counter hearing aids, they are essentially just raising the volume of sound. They're not specifically tailored to your hearing loss uh, because they can't be. They're, they're, you're just buying them in a package and putting them in, their ear, in your ear. So although they might help in certain situations, like watching the TV, they might be good for, the second you add any sort of noise, like anything, you know, you open a window and there's a stiff breeze outside, that noise is going to be amplified by the device as well. And it's going to overpower often uh, the, the thing that you're trying to hear, the person or the TV or the radio or whatever you're listening to, music, whatnot. So in general, no, you have to get a hearing test. Um, you really shouldn't ever have any amplifier in your ear without it being somewhat calibrated to your specific hearing loss. Uh, I don't wanna put fear in, into this and say that, but unfortunately it, it is true to some degree that you can damage your hearing more if you over amplify it for too long or if you over amplify it just because you're putting in a general amplifier that's not really tuned. Um, <clears throat> now, there are some companies that offer a service where you buy the hearing aid from them at a less expensive price, and then you send them a copy of your audiogram from a local specialist, and then they program the hearing aids. The, the problem with those companies is that every adjustment that needs to be made Every tuning appointment, everything has to be done by mailing the hearing aids back to them, having them tune it, then getting it shipped back to you, testing it. If you find out in five minutes it's not the right setting, you have to send it back. It, you know, it, it just turns into this very cumbersome thing. So the best recommendation is find a local place that you're comfortable going with, uh, going to, that you feel is com uh, competent and uh, that has a decent pricing structure um, with, with, their, with their devices, if you're going with private pay or insurance or something like that. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay, good. <laughs> you're welcome. One more question here. Um, any tips for dealing with bad, t and I never know how to say this, ringing in the ears is what I'm gonna say. T t sure. Ringing in their tinnitus, tinnitus, yeah. same tomato, tomato. Um, everyone has that, uh, that, that question with the, the pronunciation too. It's both. Um, yes. Yeah, so tinnitus is ringing in the ear. Uh, it is commonly associated with high frequency hearing loss, uh, but it can be associated with a lower frequency hearing loss as well. Um, essentially just to be clear on it, it's a totally fabricated sound inside your brain. No one else's. It's not a real sound in the sense of sound waves moving air and stimulating your eardrum and going through the whole system. House Institute has some good resources. There's also like a national tinnitus society that you can check out. Um, but basically they don't know a ton about why it starts, but they do know that it's commonly associated when you have damage or hearing loss in certain areas. Not always, you can have totally normal hearing and have tinnitus, but it, it, it's almost always connected with some sort of hearing loss. How it works essentially, just a, real quick, is once you get below a certain level of hearing loss, the tinnitus kind of kicks in. When you start wearing hearing aids and you raise that hearing loss above that level, the tinnitus typically goes away. 
So usually the best uh, treatment for tinnitus is wearing some sort of masking device. And in the context of hearing loss, the masking device would be the hearing aid. And the reason why is when, when you have a hearing loss, you're not hearing certain ambient sounds like a squeaky door hinge or the shuffling of your slippers on your hardwood floor or the, the truck driving by outside. You're losing a lot of those soft sounds with hearing loss. And that's when the tinnitus starts to kick in because your brain is not hearing these sounds it's used to hearing. And so it starts to make up the sound to supplement. That's the the, the faulty wiring inside our brains does that sometimes. In this case, if you start hearing those environmental sounds better again, for example, with hearing aids, typically the tinnitus will reduce or go away. So again, for this individual that asked that question, if you have tinnitus and you've never been tested or, or addressed it at all, I would suggest going to a local place, getting tested, figuring out what the hearing loss is, if the hearing loss justifies hearing aids, if it's, if it's at a level that hearing aids would help, uh, the specialist or the audiologist will talk to you about this, of course. Wearing hearing aids will typically help the tinnitus in addition to helping your hearing loss. Great question. Yeah, that is. I learned a lot from that too. Um, I just want to take a peek at the time here. It's about 11.15 and I don't know how much time you have, Justin. We still have about uh, 10 or so people in here. Yeah, I, I have another 20 minutes or so, so I'm good on time. Great. I think it would be helpful just for the comments I've seen, um, if we could talk a little bit about coping with hearing loss, especially maybe adult onset hearing loss, if you have any suggestions there. Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, in my opinion, the coping strategy that works the best is being honest with yourself and friends and family um, and taking out the um, uh, passive aggressive nature of, of joking about hearing loss and, and discounting it. Um, so a lot of people that are unfamiliar with hearing loss, and, and this is not so much the individual with hearing loss, although it can be, um, typically, you know, here, here, let, let me state this. You know, I sell a product that is really expensive and no one wants. <laughs> you know, it, it is literally something that it, it, it is thousands of dollars and it, no one buys hearing aids to look cool. Right. It, it's, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of money on these things to enhance our image and our style. No one does it for these things, you know. So what that means is no matter who you are, you really don't want to wear hearing aids. If you don't want to spend a ton of money on them and you don't want people to know you have them. You know, it's, it's all kind of in that negative statement. The reality is hearing aids are crazy advanced technology. They are way more advanced than really anything you use on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of their singular function. You know, your phone is very advanced in terms of it can do a lot of different things, but hearing aids do one specific thing really well. So they're, they're really cool. You know, they, 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 they offer so much advantage to life and all they do is work at improving your daily life. You know, that's their function is to improve your communication with people you love and care about. There's nothing negative about that. However, because they cost a lot and they're not perfect and no one wants them, they get this really bad rap. And so one of the coping strategies is if you find out you, you have hearing loss, anything you can do to work that into acceptance and acknowledgement that I have this problem. It's not your fault. It doesn't matter. It's just there. The next step then is how do I address the problem? Is it hearing aids? Is it, uh, you know, depending on the issue, is it speech therapy? If it's a speech thing it associated with hearing loss, uh, do I get an amplifier? What's the next step? Um, and in that step and in that acknowledgement, talking with your family and your friends, incorporating them into the process is really important having them come with you as support to your hearing test and your consultation is really important because 
it doesn't really do any good to you um, or your family and loved ones, which are really the only people that get affected with the hearing loss, right, is, is yourself and the people you care about. It doesn't do any good to sweep it under the carpet, you know, or to joke about it or belittle it or yourself. You know, I have a lot of family members that come in and joke about how they don't want to hear their wife, you know, or husband because they like the silence. I can guarantee that's never the case. I mean, it, it's a joke, it, but it's a way to belittle the kind of the thing, because if you discount it, maybe it's less of a problem. You know, there's some psychology going on there. Um, don't do that. And, and the reason why is it just doesn't do you anything. Uh, it doesn't do anything for you except for really make the problem harder to deal with. Um, you know, the problem is benevolent. It, it's just there. It, it doesn't care. It's, it's not taking sides. It's not spiteful. It's just a problem. And, and just like vision loss, if you have a vision loss and you want to drive or you want to see, you get glasses and you stylize them and you, you own them and you're proud of them. That's the attitude you really should have about hearing aids. They're expensive. They take effort. They're not perfect, but their sole purpose and job is to improve your life. And if you look at it from that point of view, a lot of times the negativity around hearing loss shifts to positivity. I really like the way you put that. That was a, that was a very good answer. I hadn't heard a lot of that before, so thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's, you know, it's been built up over years uh, of experience of just seeing how people react to their hearing loss and then also how family members react. And the, everything I just described is very common. I, I mean, I see it every single day still. It, it's still just the most uh, prevalent is kind of that um, belittling of it. And it, it just, again, it just doesn't do any good. So hopefully that helps with anyone dealing with it. That, that's where I'd suggest to start. Thank you. Okay, that's, we don't have any more questions yet, but if there's more, I don't remember in the email. Oh, um, there is actually a really good question I wanted to address in here. Um, we did talk about training friends and family to be more conscious on stuff when they're speaking to you. Yes, that, that's kind of part of that incorporation or involving them in the process a little bit um, so they can uh, understand the hearing loss better. So that's good. Um, I'll answer this one really quick and then I'm gonna get to the actual question, the heart of the question that I really wanna address as well. So one of the questions was why are clear face masks so difficult to make comfortable? <laughs> the ones out there are miserable uh, for the wearers. Um, <laughs> they're so uncomfortable because they're face masks and they're clear and they're made of plastic and they fog up. I mean, they're, the, the simple answer is it's just because of what they are. I have not found any clear face masks that really work other than a face shield. So if you want to cover your face, um, but still see, or, or if you're going out with a family member that you want to lip read or, or you need to be able to see their lips, but you want them to be protected, having a face shield is going to be the best because that's going to be very comfortable to wear and it's going to have at least some protection for other people, you know, with your droplets and so forth. It's not gonna protect that individual that much, but um, all the science seems to be showing that cloth face masks don't do that anyway. So you're not really necessarily at a higher risk from what the CDC says. Uh, I mean, so, some of the stuff we're still learning, obviously they're saying double mask now and do this and that. But if you're gonna go with kind of a basic cloth mask or medical mask that doesn't tightly seal around the nose, if you're not doing an N95, then a face shield can be a good supplement, especially if it's a friend and family that's maybe visiting at your home and you can still socially distance and things like that. Okay, the so, last question. Oh yeah, no, that's okay. That is a question that popped up. Um, it says that she has family that wears hearing aids and they have lots of irritation inside the ears. Is there a way to help prevent or ease that? Uh, yeah, it, it is per person. So sometimes the irritation is just simply uh, the device tickling the hairs in the ear. And I'm not talking about the nerves, the cilia, that sense sound. I'm talking about actual hairs that grow in your ear. Uh, and the only solution there is just getting a different tip or fitting that is more comfortable. Uh, sometimes it's because people don't clean the tips of the hearing aids often enough with rubbing alcohol. 
um, which sanitizes them and kills the bacteria and the germs on them. Um, and what that means is it'll start to itch because the bacteria and the germs are irritating the canal skin, the ear canal skin. So the, the easy thing to do is to just clean them more often. Um, sometimes, and you'll need to talk to your dermatologist or your primary care physician, but sometimes uh, using some sort of moisturizing cream because the inside of the ear is dry, um, that can help. Uh, so there, there are some uh, uh, solutions, but I would say in general, only about 5% of my clients experience itching or irritation on a permanent basis. It's really common in the beginning as you're getting adapted to them, but over the course of a few days, few weeks, few months, typically the itching will reduce or go away altogether. Um, so if it continues, uh, explore some of those other avenues to see if there's dry skin in the ear or if just cleaning them more often would help. Great question though. Thank you. Okay, so one, I think this is a really good question because this is something I get asked all the time. What is the difference between going to an audiologist and, go, and going to a place like Miracle Ear? Okay, so Miracle Ear is a franchise. Um, it's just a brand name. Uh, I actually used to work for Miracle Ears for my brother when I first started doing this. So Miracle Ears owned by Signia, which used to be Siemens. Um, they're not a special hearing aid, just to be clear. Um, and franchises like Audibel, uh, Miracle Ear, Bernafon, Belltone, those are all just hearing aid brands. There's nothing extra special about any one of them, other than sometimes like Miracle Ear, they'll have national networks that you can kind of go throughout at no charge. Um, so it just makes it a little bit easier. Um, companies like Miracle Ear only sell one product, Miracle Ear, and that's only manufactured by one hearing aid brand, Signia. So what that means is, uh, although Miracle Ears can be extremely effective, uh, there are, some of their offices are great, um, some of them are not, just like any uh, business or franchise. Um, in general, they're a fine place to go. So if you have a good Miracle Ear with a good reputation and you like the, the office and the, the staff, go to them. They'll, they'll be able to help you out for sure. Uh, and, and, and Miracle Ears are never, as far as I know, are never audiologists. They're always hearing aid dispensers. I'm a hearing aid dispenser. My office is the listening stack. Um, I could choose to franchise. I mean, this would never happen, but I, I could branch off and actually buy Miracle Ear franchises and then become a Miracle Ear dealer. So in terms of that example, Miracle Ear is just a brand name. It's typically going to be a hearing aid center. Um, when you look at audiology clinics um, and audiology hearing aid centers, those are usually two different things. So clinical audiology points to testing, um, medical. Uh, doesn't Clinical audiologists typically don't actually fit hearing aids or dispense hearing aids at all. They just do clinical audiology. Uh, they're usually associated with hospitals or ear, nose, and throat clinics. Um, they will do OSHA testing for job sites. Uh, they, they do a lot of different things, but it's more research-based and more medical-based. That's clinical audiology. Dispensing audiology or hearing, aid, uh, hearing centers based in um, helping, hearing, helping address hearing loss is essentially the same thing as a hearing aid center. So you have a hearing aid center and you have a dispensing audiologist hearing aid center or audiology clinic that dispenses hearing aids as well. And there is really no difference uh, between these two on the hearing aid side of things. So if you're looking at buying hearing aids or getting information about hearing tests around hearing aids and hearing loss, any repairing hearing aids, anything to do with hearing aids, an audiology dispensing hearing aid clinic versus a hearing aid center are identical. Their services, their products, their pricing is all gonna be basically similar. However, if you have a medical need, um, like an ear infection or, uh, or a, 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 a rare problem trying to diagnose Meniere's disease or something like that to bring back that example, 
typically audiology clinics are going to do that. So essentially they are, sometimes uh, audiologists are masters, they have MBA or uh, master's degrees uh, in audiology. New audiologists nowadays have to be, uh, have doctorates. Um, they're not always medical doctors, but they do have to have a doctorate uh, in, in audiology. And then that just is based on whether they want to go into clinical audiology, where it just be a doctorate, or uh, medical audiology, where it be a MD, I believe. Um, so if you're going to fit hearing aids, doesn't matter. Go to whichever one is good pricing and you're comfortable with and seems competent. Um, if you're going to figure out health problems about your ears and your hearing, an audiology clinic or an ENT clinic is where you'd want to go. Um, that all being said, um, higher levels of education in audiology do not equal better service or care. Um, they don't equal bad service or care either, but the degree itself, the master's or the doctorate, I have countless times had people move from out of the area or move from one office to my office and when I hook up their hearing aids and I look at their settings and I look at how they've been helped and handled from a high-end audiology clinic or audiologist, I end up throwing my arms up and saying, what the heck were they doing? Why would they do it this way? So I, I've definitely seen audiology clinics make really poor decisions when it comes to hearing loss. So again, it really comes down to if you go into the office and it's clean and it's professional and it feels right and you get good explanation and you feel comfortable with the audiologist or the hearing aid dispenser, go with that office, at least for the trial period. Get a feel for them. Um, don't take the degree on their wall as the end all say all of how well your service is going to be because it's just not true most of the time. Sometimes it is, of course, but most of the time it is not. Hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. Okay, um, so in I, I still have more time. So if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer, but I think that addresses everything on my list of things to talk about. And then a lot of the questions uh, that were sent over. So what else, anything else from, from everyone? Anything else, anybody have any questions? Wanna put them in the chat, now's the time. While we're waiting, I just wanna say, um, Justin is volunteering his time here today and uh, we're just all very grateful to him for his time, his expertise and his willingness to help out the network um, and do this webinar. So thank you, Justin. You're very welcome. It's, it's always a pleasure to do things like this and I'm happy to do it. That's great. And um, Su Susan, I will uh, make my email available uh, to anyone. So if anyone has follow-up questions, um, they are uh, welcome to contact you to, to go through you, or they can contact me directly if it's a very specific or a confidential question. Um, if they're concerned uh, about, uh, you know, just keeping it confidential, they can definitely email me uh, directly if they like. That's very generous of you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So I see a couple questions. Um, Most of them. I'm, oh, sorry. Yeah. Says, I'm more interested in learning about what leads to hearing loss, especially at the human development level or the infant level via genetic diseases. Um, so genetic diseases, I, you know, it's, it's, it's over my head in terms of some of the, you know, I know some of the basic knowledge, but in terms of each genetic disease, there's so many of them, there's so many specifics that the health community doesn't know about. I don't have any specifics there other than there are definitely diseases that can start affecting the hearing loss at the infant level um, or throughout the, life, uh, throughout the person's life. Um, I don't have a lot of good information that I'm confident in sharing about those specifics, but if you have a specific question, if you'd like to email it to uh, Susan or myself, uh, you definitely can. I can do some research and find out if I can point you in the right direction. Thanks. And the general question at the end, any ideas where to go for that? 
um, House Institute is, is a great starting point. Again, they do a lot of broad types of studies and audiology. So houseinstitute.com. Um, and I'll, again, have that uh, link available that Susan can send out to everyone. Anything else, guys? Okay, well, I think we will wrap this up then. Um, okay. Thank you all for being here today. And again, thank you, Justin, for your time. Um, for, I will be emailing all of you with the link and Justin's email address, um, hopefully by the end of the day, maybe by the end of the week. Um, but you'll definitely <laughs> get that information. Um, we have a thank you, Justin, and thank you, Susan, comment in there. So thank you to Suzanne for saying that. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Susan, too. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, everyone about this stuff. It's it's so important, and I, I enjoy doing it. So Great. Well, it shows that you enjoy it. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Okay. Bye, bye everyone. Have a great day.